everybody, and welcome to episode 43 of All About African Violets. All About African Violets is musically sponsored by Ted Yoder. You can hear his great music on his website. It is also available from iTunes, and his website is tedyoder.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my sunroom. Come on in. It's kind of sunny today. I, it's it's uh, Finally, it has been a, a week of very crazy weather here in Illinois, and particularly in the Chicagoland area. Uh, we've had flood conditions all over town. I've been very lucky. Uh, really just a little bit of water in my basement from one corner, which uh, I've known has needed a little bit of repair for a while now. So I was very lucky. Uh, unlike when I first moved here about eight years ago, nine years ago, um, when I had constant water issues every time it rained. Holy smokes, it was bad. But I was very lucky this time. Others were not so lucky. There has been widespread flooding, huge ro the entire um, I-94, what's called the Bishop Ford Freeway or Expressway here, um, shut down for two days uh, because of water. All of the rivers overflowing their banks. Very, very crazy. And, uh, and other issues of the world this week, the horrible bombing in Boston. My, um, If you were affected by this, my heart goes out to you. I am keeping everyone there in my thoughts and my prayers. What a terrible thing. It's been a wild week in the world this week. But here, here in my sunroom, things are calm, things are relaxed, so come on in and uh, we'll talk for a while. I've got some good stuff for you this week. I think you're gonna like it. So let me put my glasses on here. Um, I wanna thank you all also for all the get well wishes. I, um, I gotta tell you, I told you last week, strep throat, the no fun plan. I hope I don't get that ever again, or at least not for a very, very long time. And for those of you who still might be experiencing some playback issues with Blip, um, with the website, I'm not sure what else to tell you. I'm so sorry that this has started happening. I do believe it's on blips and for most for the most part. But if you are and I think that they have done what they can to correct it. If you're still having trouble though, one of the things that they suggest is that you clear your cache on your computer and I will leave a link to their website that tells you how to do that if you don't already know. And hopefully that'll take care of it. I've had a question from Lori this week, and she said, do you feed plants in full bloom any differently? Are they hungrier? Do blooms take away energy from the center leaf, that the center leaves need to continue growing or cause the outer leaves to age? I'm torn between pushing blossoms to the center between leaves. I do it, especially if it will help the center growth of the leaves stay symmetrical or nudging them away from the center so they don't block the light from the middle. It seems like my mentor once warned about pushing blooms between leaves toward the middle if unintended pressure against a leaf might deform it. Deform might not have been the word she used. It was a long time ago. These are all really good questions, Lori, and they make a lot of sense. I don't feed plants in bloom any differently. I do use, uh, I do use a bloom booster on the pre-show schedule for plants. But once, like if I was just letting a plant bloom, no, I would not use any fertilizer differently. Um, a plant does need energy to bloom. Um, one of the reasons you disbud when you grow for show is so that the energy goes into the foliage before you allow the plant to come into bloom. So I, I don't know that it necessarily takes energy from one place or another. It just sort of, you know, it kind of balances balances itself out. Um, the other the next question you asked was I'm torn between oh about the blossoms moving the blossom stalks up. I often will tease blossom peduncles up through the leaves to get a a, a better looking head of, of blossom. There are two schools of thought on this. Many people do not do this at all. They just let them bloom sideways out like under the leaves so that they're laying down around. I don't care for that look and I, th I think it looks better to tease them up if the peduncles are strong enough to do it. And um, you are correct. If something is pushing against a leaf 
for a great length of time, it can deform it, so to speak, or, or twist it or force it to grow in a way that you might not want. So what, we're to, what I'm talking about here though is growing for show. So if I have pushed those leaves up um, and we have forced that plant to come into bloom, yes, sometimes the center crown growth of the leaves can be affected by that. That's one of the reasons why as soon as, as, soon as the show is over, I disbud, the, set, the crown gets a chance to relax and, and, and I keep things disbudded then for a while to let things kind of get back on a regular track. We've just taken a plant in 12 weeks and forced it to bloom on command. I think they need a little rest after that. So you can go either way. Um, do what suits you, see how it, try it with a couple of plants, shifting the peduncles up, see if that, how it looks, if it looks better to you. You truly can go either way. So, all right, let's move right into tips and treasures because I have a real treasure for you today. I have, um, I'm going to share with you an interview that I did with Dale Martins uh, a couple weeks ago at the Illinois State Show. Dale, if you are not familiar with her, she's actually an internationally known hybridizer of violets, streptocarpus, and syningia plants. She used to write a column for the African Violet Magazine. Um, <clears throat> she and I both started our violet careers in Southern California, so we do have some things in common. And she is a, a wonderful grower and a very interesting person. And, um, and I actually got her to film a number of of segments so you'll be able to see more of her in the coming weeks but for today she's going to talk about African violets how she got started with them how she got started hybridizing and she's going to share some of her growing tips so I will I will see you on the other side of the footage Hi everybody, I'm here with Dale Martins. And this is so exciting. I'm really thrilled that she agreed to be on the podcast. And she's got a lot to share with you. Dale is an internationally known hybridizer of both violets and streptocarpus and also syningas. Yep. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yep. She and I have actually a lot in common. We both started our African violet careers in Southern California and ended up back home, well, home for me, uh, in Illinois. And so welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad Thank you're here. You. Thank you. Everyone is going to be so happy to have you here. I'm so glad you agreed to sit down with me. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. And this is home for me, too. We retired back home. That's great. Yeah. Well, I was in Ventura. That's where I started mm -hmm. growing. I know that you know a lot of the folks mm -hmm. there, yep. and that was my original home club. Mm -hmm. Which club were you in out there? Well, the Orange County. Orange F County. Yeah, Orange County. And then I was in Grow and Study Gesneriads also. Okay. Okay, great. Well, Dale, how did you get interested in African violets? Well, my mother-in-law, I, I knew my mother-in-law when I was only 14. She was my Sunday school teacher. Oh. And um, so I started dating her son when I was 14. So childhood sweetheart. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and she grew African violets in a bay window. And she had probably those vintage African violets that are so precious to us, and I wish I had some of those now. Any, I know. I always look for them. Yeah. And then, um, so I didn't grow them at that time. I waited till we got to California, and then I went to a mall show, and it was fantastic. Here were these African violets, which I knew, and then there's those other plants, which I learned were Gesneriads, and those people looked like they were having so much fun. They were laughing, they were joking. One of them had a birthday, they had a birthday cake, they sang happy birthday, and I said to myself, you know what, I'm pretty sure I can grow an African violet, I could probably grow those other things, but why don't I join this group? And I did. So that's how I got started was because of a mall show. Well, and we are in the mall today mm -hmm. here in Moline, Illinois. This is we're at the Illinois State African Violet Society's annual show, and actually Dale's Club, Quad City African Violets, is the host 
for Illinois this year and boy thank you what a great oh. space you got us and and uh, so we're all we're all very casual here today yeah. guys it's set up and entries yeah. and all that kind of stuff is going on so a mall show can make a difference it makes all the difference in the world and we always try to make sure we have a sign-up sheet for people interested and they can write their email or address mm -hmm. and then we make sure that we contact them actually Monday is, this coming Monday is our, sh our uh, normal meeting, and we always have Leith Bingo. And then that way the new oh, people. Yeah. I hopefully think we used to do that at Ventura all the time. <laughs> I love that. Well, it's a way for anybody who comes to see us, you know, for the first time to go home with something. When you have new club members, you have to make sure they go home with something. And then tell them, bring it back next month, and we'll guide you. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, so you started growing African violets, but you began to have an interest, if I'm not mistaken, in hybridizing African violets as well. Yes. yes. And the reason for that was um, I wanted to create a longer lasting flower. Okay. And um, after talking with Jeff Smith, um, he, answers, he answers questions oh, for us often does. on the he podcast. Does. He's awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. And, you know, after chatting with him about it and what's dominant and things like that, then I decided to give it a try for myself. And so um, I wanted to make sure that I had green, at least as the uh, female parent. And so uh, what I did was my first cross was... Of all things, this is Emerald City, the sport, the chimera. Mm -hmm. What Jeff told me was the middle color in a chimera is the dominant color. Well, the middle color is green on okay. Emerald City. And so, of all things to cross it with, I love Louisiana lanyap. This is a cross with Louisiana yes. lanyap? No yes. way! <laughs> Guys, I'll, I will I'll look for both of those plants. I'll look for pictures and, and uh, link them on the show notes. Isn't that amazing? It's a, it is amazing. When you see the parents of this plant, you will be amazed. Mm -hmm. And it's a plant that I have um, tried to grow more than once, yeah. and uh, it's gorgeous. And I'm, I'm looking forward to growing it again because, yes, I got a leaf. I added to my collection. I, I didn't limit today. I added. Well, one thing I can tell you about this particular uh, hybrid is I have not taken a flower off of this thing in probably three months. It just sits on my lower shelf. I don't turn it. Um, it just grows. And unfortunately, this would have been huge, but on the way here, of course, I dropped it. And so there's a gap <laughs> on one side and I had the bag yeah and I had to take an entire row off of it but I'm gonna enter it anyway um, well this is certainly <laughs> already more than a foot in <laughs> diameter guys I don't know if you can, can you tell I mean this is a big yeah. big plant but you can see how much green is on there so it inherited a lot of green from Emerald City and it did not get the Louisiana lanyap edging or anything, I, I don't know why, but Heartland's Heirloom Lace is its sister. And that one um, has some green on it, not nearly what this does, and that one has kind of a lacy netting on upper two petals. And the blossoms? Yeah. Okay. But the flowers on this just last forever. So that's why I like it, and it I don't even have to fuss with it. Like I said, I've just left it alone for, for months. And I wick water it, so I just make sure that the, the uh, reservoir is full. Well, so actually, I was just going to ask you that. How do you grow your plants? So you, you, you wick, but do you use reservoirs all the time? I use reservoirs all the time because I travel a lot. Now, it's key to me that I use a non-urea fertilizer I only do an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon, believe it or not, and um, I never use high bloom. I almost always use uh, Better Grow or Grow More orchid fertilizers. And the reason for that is because the numbers are pretty much even, 
and so it's getting um, attention to the roots and the leaves. And to me, if a plant is healthy, it's got robust leaves, and it's got really good root system, it will produce the maximum number of flowers genetically programmed. So okay. that's why I, I never use high bloom. So when you say high bloom, do you mean what is also called a bloom booster yes, fertilizer? Yes, right. Okay. Right. And, um, and I particularly noticed, I was using, you know, the, the, it's when the middle number is high, usually 36 to 50. And, um, but I don't, I use an even, uh, one of mine is 20, 14, 13, another one is 30, 10, 10, and I alternate those, but I don't use bloom boosters. Okay. And it's the same for my other gaznariads, and as you can see, it does quite nicely, and a quarter teaspoon I think is too much. So I just use an eighth of a teaspoon for that. Okay. And I leach the plants about every eight weeks. I leach with, um, I ha happen to have reverse osmosis, but you could use tap water. As long as you pour at least two cups worth of water through the pot, let that totally drain so it leaches all those nasty old um, salts in there. And, and this is key to me too. When you are transplanting an African violet or any other plant even, the first thing you do to that old pot is you leach the soil. You want to leach that old nasty stuff out of that pot because it doesn't make sense to then put it in a new pot with fresh soil around it and you've got that core that's nasty. So always, always leach the pot uh, before you transplant it into a larger pot. That's a very interesting. Now, I, um, we've been talking about leaching on the mm -hmm. podcast more recently. Someone asked a question about it, and I have done it, uh, mm -hmm. but, but only to try to reverse an irreversible oh. <laughs> problem. Mm -hmm. it, it just didn't, it wasn't what I did. Mm -hmm. And I have felt in the past that if I repotted regularly enough, that I that I didn't really need to leach, but you find that that's a really great, right, a good step for you. It's right. working really well. Yes, it's working really well. <laughs> yes, because it, it just doesn't make sense to me. You've got this pot, and here it's had all these fertilizer salts in it, and yeah, you're putting it, repotting it into a new pot, but you've still got the roots surrounded by that nasty old salt stuff. Okay. So that's why I always leach first and then put it in the new pot with fresh soil around it. Okay. Well, that is very interesting, Dale. Thank you for that. Um, so let me ask you a question. I know you've got another hybrid here you want to share with us, and we do you guys see it. It's really, really cool. Um, why do you show your African violence? Well, for one thing, I, I'm a teacher at heart, and so I like to show plants and talk to the public. I'm almost always out there, you know, and I've got yeah, a I reservoir. I had to drag her in here, you guys. <laughs> I have my reservoir, an empty reservoir, so I show people how to wick water. And to me, it's fun. It's educating the public. And plus, I want new members for the club, and I want to get others uh, enthusiastic about um, growing African violets. So by educating the public then, I'm, and by having mall shows, I think it brings new people in. Okay. Well, you got to show us this one. Tell us, tell well, us about this. this. This is really interesting, you guys. Well, Sex Vespa Verde is the mother. And um, what I did was, again, because Sex has green on it, it's white with green, it's also a wasp, and it's also variegated. <clears throat> and I learned from Jeff Smith that you need to have the variegation in the mom in order to get variegation. So that's why I use Sex Vespa Verde then as the um, mother. Now, for some bizarre reason, I ended up with almost bell flowers there's no bustle on this one. Most, let's see, it was about 50%. I'd say 50% of my seedlings had bustles. And bustles can make things really awkward um, because they, uh, they, don't they lift. They don't want to yeah. yeah, they're all kind of wobbly. <clears throat> yeah. They're all over the place. 
But this one I call Dale's Sleigh Bells, B-E-L-L-E-S. And so this one doesn't have a Heartland name? No, it doesn't. And part of the problem is people complain that the word Heartlands is too long to write on a oh. label. Oh, please. Yeah. H-L's <coughs> apostrophe S. H-L apostrophe S. So, so I've kind of switched to, to Dale on that. And um, this has, uh, oh, and Heinz will kill me for it. I can't remember that. He's got a... Um, a fantasy, uh, it's a real large standard with fantasy blossom and that's the pollen parent. Okay. And but you'll, you'll email me later with that, right? Yes, in like fact, there's one out, it, okay, there's well, probably we'll, one I'll in find, the we'll show. find it in the show, you guys. <laughs> well, again, Dale, this has a huge number of blossoms. Mm. This is a really, I mean, a very, very floriferous. Guys, this is in like a solo cup and a, and a little teeny pot. So, I mean, this is a semi-miniature, you think? You yes. Were, we were talking about this earlier. I've grown it out. This is the third generation, and I've got five of these because, and I even put some in four-inch pots to see if, to it, see would, if it would, yeah, okay. get bigger. But this seems to be it, and it's about seven and a half inches. And it's good uh, size. Yeah, and you can see it's really got a lot of blooms on it. They're unusual. Um, I don't even know what color to call it. Well, they're mm. kind of like a smoky lavender, really. Yeah, smoky okay. sounds like a good definition. And like, like, look at the the upper two yeah. petals on that. It, yeah. It's just kind of odd. But I did find out that uh, so some of the sinks uh, have bell in their ancestry. I did find that out. Okay. So that might be why I've got that kind of shape to it. And this one is Dale's, say it again. Oh, Sleigh Bells, B-E-L-L-E-S. Dale's Sleigh Bells. Heinz's Seduction. Heinz, oh, okay. <laughs> Heinz's Seduction is the <clears throat> parent. The mom? Dad. The dad. Yeah, because I needed variegation, so that's why um, I there. used the sinks. Well, so, Dale, <clears throat> besides your own hybrids, mm -hmm. do you have a favorite Violet. Jean-Pierre Cruteau. <laughs> I'm growing that right now. We've been talking about that one on the podcast, oh, too. I love it. I just, I just knocked it over, you guys. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I just love it. And it's an oldie. Yeah. And um, I don't know. There's just something about it. The well, Cruteau. It's the gigantic. Yeah. I mean, it, can, it literally can be gigantic, yeah. you guys. So it's that's that's probably my favorite. Yeah. Very, very cool. I, um, you know, I, I, you may or may not know this, but I, right before National last year, I lost all my plants oh. um, due uh, to what we think was micronutrient toxicity. I was yeah. really ramping up for show mm -hmm. to go to Detroit, and I ended up with nothing but a black garbage bag oh. full of, I mean, I went to Detroit. I had, for the first time in a very long time, there were no Violets, no other kids, nothing in my home, nothing. Wow. So I have been rebuilding and restarting mm -hmm. for this whole last year. Um, and it's really been kind of wild. And Jean-Pierre Croteau is oh. one of the plants <laughs> that I got a leaf of, oh. and it's still in a solo cup, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. about the size of, yeah. of this already and ready to, yeah. to go on. It's, it's a favorite of mine as well. The other one's Frozen in Time. I just love Frozen in Time. So what's your favorite tool that you use with your plants? <laughs> well, I'm trying to think. I, um, a toothpick, of all things. I use a toothpick for a lot of things. Okay. Um, I use that to pop off suckers. Um, I just end up using that a lot. That's a good one. No one has told me to no. pick before. That's a new one. <laughs> it's cheap. <laughs> it is cheap. Well, Kent Stork says his favorite tool is the trash can. Oh, so yeah, that's cheap too. Yeah. Do you feel as a as a violet grower that you have a specialty? Well. I don't do as well with the smaller ones. Me either. I, I do fairly well with larger plants. Um, when I lived in California, uh, I would it was a thing for me to grow them so that I had to tip them to get them out the door. And I had some like Granger's Wonderland, mm -hmm. White Pride, and Splendiferous. 
that was, uh, I remember those were um, way beyond the African violet ring, you know, I used to transport them, and I had to tip them to get them out the door. Do you, you know, since we both grew initially in Southern California, I, I'm curious to know, do you find that things that maybe you grew there, like if you grow those varieties here, like I, one of my best plants, which is at the beginning of the podcast, was Fisherman's Paradise. Oh. It was mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And it never grew that large when I came, when I brought it home, and then it was one of the ones that I lost. Mm -hmm. I since have, have it back, mm -hmm. and it's growing well. But things never have grown as large for me here as they did yes. there. Do you find that to be true? Absolutely true, and I think there's, the main reason is furnaces here. You need a furnace in the winter, so therefore you've got that change of temperature and you've got humidity change. Okay. And I tend to think when that furnace kicks on is when I have a problem because my plants seem to um, dry out faster. Okay. And, and then the switch this time of year, the, the switch is uh, powdery mildew mm -hmm. because the, um, at this time of year it's less furnace and it's a little bit colder, so the night and day temperatures mm -hmm. are, are not the same. So yeah, California, I was able to really grow big violets there, and I think because the temperature was consistent. We hardly had a furnace on, yeah. and in Los Angeles, we really didn't need air conditioning, except maybe in August. Well, see, I lived in Santa Clarita at the mm. edge of the desert, and so it was hot, mm. hot, hot, hot all the time. But that was consistent for you, yeah. so it's not like you had big changes like we do here in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. That's very true. I've, I'm, I'm really glad, I'm, I'm so glad I thought to ask you that because mm -hmm. remembering that we were both uh, initially grew there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad that you sat down with, with me to talk about violets, and I have one last question for you. And I, what advice, would you give a beginning grower? What would be the best advice that you could give someone who's brand new? I think the thing is, uh, newbies tend to, to buy a whole bunch of plants all at once, and then it's hard to really pay attention and, and take care of each. You guys, <laughs> she just said limit your collection yes. in, in another way. <laughs> Keep going. Yes. <laughs> Limit, limit. I did not pay her. <laughs> Definitely limit the collection. And the other thing is, something I've learned that I learned from the Gisneriads that I transferred to African Violets is, just because one grows very nicely, the one next to it doesn't have to. And that's because of the genetics of each one. If something has more species in it, maybe it doesn't bloom as much, maybe it drops the blossoms or whatever, or maybe its leaves turn yellow because of it can't take as much fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So pay attention and don't expect this one to do as well as this one or, or because they're individuals okay. with different genetics. Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. Well, thank you. You guys, I have, I have I have begged Dale. Uh, she's going to come back actually and talk more about her streptocarpus and her other Gisneriad hybridization. So thank you for being with us today to talk about violets. And uh, I'll be right back, you guys. Thank you. Wow. Isn't she great? I mean, she just, she has, she's one of those people who has so much knowledge and is so willing to share it. And I was so, I had, I did have to kind of talk her into sitting down with me. And, and once she sat down, she was very comfortable. So it was really a lot of fun to talk with her. And uh, I, I was just, and I did, I will link to the plant, the parent plants of the, the violets that she shared. The first violet that she shared, the name of it is Heartland's Lime Sherbet, and the second one is Dale's Sleigh Bells. And when you see the parent plants for both of these plants, you're gonna be like, how does that happen? But I think that's one of the mysteries of hybridizing, and uh, if you do have questions about hybridizing, please feel free to leave them because I will check in with Dr. Jeff Smith about those, and he is truly an expert in that area, as you guys know. You know, 
Uh, there's before we go take a look at what's on the stands there's something I've been meaning to remind everybody about if it's something I know a lot of you are already members of the AVSA but it's something that um, I haven't mentioned lately one of the great things about growing African violets is that we have this national and truly international society the African violet society of America um, the AVSA there is a link on the podcast on our webpage over on the right on the sidebar and it says join the AVSA and you can click that it will open up a PDF file of of the application that you can print out fill it in and send it in to the AVSA and join you get the African violet magazine uh, every other month and that is a truly wonderful benefit of membership and for per, particularly for those of you who um, may not get to go to national you know eventually you're going to see great photos from the national show there in the magazine and wonderful articles and I just I haven't encouraged you guys lately to join the AVSA and I, I was thinking about it this morning so um, if you haven't joined, it might be might be time, uh, and it's that you can get the magazine and just really have a great time and read the articles, the things that I share with you guys when it comes every other month. It's it's really a wonderful wonderful benefit of membership. So well, um, it is time to take a look at what's on the stands now. Things are you know I have done some grooming this week and some disbudding again, and uh, just trying to work things in to get them into nice shape and get them to grow. Most of my plants now, as you can tell, are standards. They take longer to grow. So, and, and, uh, but they seem easier to me to grow than the minis and the semis. But take a look and I'll see you on the other side. Time for a look at what's on the stands. We're here in the guest room. These are the show hopefuls. And, uh, Everybody looking pretty good. The trailers are starting to send out blossom stalks, but none of these semis are yet. So I'm hoping in the next week or so that they will be doing that. Let's take a look down the second shelf. Everybody just kind of growing. Nothing too exciting here. Repotting is necessary on plenty of these. This is Jean-Pierre Croteau. We've been kind of following it over the last weeks and uh, it's growing. It is a big plant, you guys. And down here, I did some cleanup and some grooming this week. And here's House of Amani with its sweet little bloom. Everybody looking pretty good. Let's head down to the basement. Everybody looking pretty good down here, too. Here's Fisherman's Paradise, the downstairs plant, trying to bloom. And I meant to tell you guys, I, I wondered if you would ask me about this one. This is Selena Dark Velvet. And normally, by now, I would take those three leaves, those three leaves that are really sticking out, I would normally have removed those. However, this plant is crown variegated and you can see that the other leaves are almost completely white so I have kept these other three um, you know these three green leaves because of because of the chlorophyll factor those are the only green leaves that are actually making chlorophyll so I'm holding on to them for a little while longer Here's, this is Buckeye Lost Love it's getting ready to bloom I'm going to let it bloom until we see what it looks like. Here is the dome tray. Nothing too exciting yet, although there's a new leaf in here that I got from my friend Julie. And uh, I'm going to cross our fingers for that one. Here are the show plants just hanging out, still being isolated. I definitely need to do a little work on some of these. Here's roulette. It thinks it wants to bloom. Not going to happen. There we go. Alright, let's go over to the other stand. Well, here it is. Another busy week. I still have not gotten the rest of these strips repotted. 
and look at Heartland's white gold already trying to bloom um, even though I just butted it before I brought it in and so is Salmon Sunset I may let, let these guys bloom and see how they do here's Chiffon Masquerade I have high hopes for it guys and here's Dancing Trail alrighty then let's head upstairs here's the kitchen shelf little Wichita girl going to town here too bad I didn't time that one a little better. Could have gone to National with me. <laughs> Here is Jersey Snowflakes, and it is quite a nice white. A single white blossom. We'll see how it does. Champagne pink. Oh, here is Sassy Sister getting ready to bloom. I gotta tell you, every time I have gotten a leaf of Sassy Sister, it turns out to be Irish Flirt. And I'm the only person in the world who's not that fond of Irish flirt. Let's uh, take a quick look around to this side. Same thing going on here with uh, Max Scorching Sun. I've left a couple of dark green leaves to help with chlorophyll. Same thing here. And this is another plant of Selena Dark Velvet. And you can see that the center leaves now are starting to green up a little bit more. Your sassy sister. Same thing here on Frosty Bubbles. I've just kind of left some of those younger green leaves that I normally would have removed. This shelf is looking pretty good, you guys. I'm kind of excited about it. Let's take a look here at the Gisneria, what I've taken to calling the Gisneria shelf. Ascananthus apconicus keeps growing. It's looking good. And once again, these blossoms are gorgeous on Moonlit Velvet, but there's only one per stem, and they fall over and lose them really quickly. Not sure I'm going to be keeping that one. Here are the columnias that I cut back last week. And I don't know if you can see in there, but they're already starting to root. And I did cut this one back a little further. Remember I told you I was going to cut these two pieces back? Cause it, and I did. And uh, again, new growth starting right away. Pretty cool. And I uh, can just kind of move right over here to the kitchen table. Take a short look at Petrochrasmia carii. I spoke with an expert this week, emailed, and he told me how to propagate this like a violet with leaf cuttings. So the next leaves that come off, I'm going to give it a try. We'll see how it goes. Let's go look at the big box violet. <laughs> Here it is. Blooming its little head off. It's great. Doing so well. And right, that little red dot in there, that's the toothpick I put in to shift this leaf. And you can see that it's shifted very, very well. And the symmetry is filled in really quite well. It's a nice plant. Well, that is the look at what's on the stands today. I'll be right back. Can you believe that the big box violet just keeps blooming? It's just great. I love having it here in the sunroom. I can just look over right now. I'm looking right at it and it's blooming and the sun is on it and it's it's just it's really wonderful um it's just a great plant i've been really i've been so pleasantly surprised by that experiment of of growing a plant actually in a pot that was too big for it to begin with and having it um in that in the mix that's already got fertilizer in it certainly i would not want to grow a shell plant in that mix but for a plant that you just want to have blooming in your living area, your space, it's a great, it's great, it's a great way to go. Well, it's time to get the bail money ready. And I tell, and you know, like I've said before, it's spring. <laughs> We've got lots of shows. Right now, of course, we're about six weeks out from national. I'm getting so excited. <laughs> um, in fact, I have stuff that came in the mail that I can't really share with you, but I'm trying to put something together for the goodie bags at National, and uh, so if you're there, you'll get you'll get what I'm putting together, <laughs> and I'll share it with the rest of you after after National. But 
There is um, in, Demo in Des Moines, Iowa, April 26th through April 28th, their annual show and sale, the Evening African Violet Club of Des Moines. And um, also the Lakeshore African Violet Society, April 27th, and this is in the place that I didn't, I'm not sure I pronounced right, Etobicoke, I think is how it's pronounced, in Ontario, in Canada. Their annual show and sale, the Lakeshore African Violet Society, uh, that's uh, next, uh, the 27th of April. Then um, the semi, their semi-annual African Violet Sale in conjunction with Mount's Botanical Garden Spring Sale, Bloom and Violets and Gisneriads of Palm Beach, Florida, is going to ha having their annual semi-annual sale April 27th and April 28th, and that is in West Palm Beach, Florida. Then there is a judge show and sale of uh, the Burbank and Montrose African Violet Societies uh, will be having their judged show and sale on April 27th at Descanso Gardens in La Cañada, Flint Ridge in California. And um, this is something that we did a lot in Southern California. When I lived there, there were, um, well, it was truly a hotbed of African Violet activity. I mean, really, who knew? There were a lot of active clubs um, at, at the turn of the last century here when I, when I lived out there. And many of the clubs would join together and have a show. And we did that, um, the Ventura Club did that with Thousand Oaks. And what it did for us was Ventura's show, I can't remember now, but I think Ventura's show was in the spring and, and Thousand Oaks show was always in the fall. And what it did was give all of us two shows to enter every year. It was great. I loved it. And it also gave me as a judge, I had one year where I was invited to judge five shows in one year. That's a lot of shows, you guys. And for a, a young judge, which I was at the time, a beginning judge, it was wonderful to have that many shows to judge and learn from that many people. I was a student judge and I judged five shows one year. It was great. And so two clubs would always band together and either have one joint show together or two shows a year. So our show in Ventura would be in conjunction with Thousand Oaks. And then Thousand Oaks would say that their show was in conjunction with, with us. And, but it was two separate clubs. You know, it was our show and their show, but we all worked together in that respect and always had a lot of fun. And the Descanso Gardens are absolutely gorgeous. It is a wonderful place to have a show. So if you are in that area in Southern California and you can get out there next weekend, I really encourage you to do so. So speaking of next weekend, next week on the podcast is question day. I'm remembering to tell you it's question day next next Sunday. So as we move, as we, it's time to keep moving forward. So as we move forward, please leave me some questions this week and, uh, and as many as you choose to, and I'll answer as many of them as I can. And, and if they require expert assistance, I will get in touch with our experts and, uh, we'll have a question field day next week. I'm hoping it's going to be warm here for the rest of, I hope spring might be here soon. I think it's in the thirties here again today in Chicago. I don't understand. I mean, we had snow flurries again yesterday. It's, it's like almost May and it's just unbelievable to me. Anyway, let me make sure I've told you everything I wanted to tell you. And I have, I have told you. So I want to thank you for joining me this week. I, I want to thank you for joining me every week. It's just great to, to um, share this with all of you and I really enjoy it every week. I, I've gotten a lot of comments, more than one this week, of people saying to me, I just found the podcast or I'm going back to the beginning and I'm watching them all in order. I'm thinking, oh, you're going to be so tired of me after about two hours. But it... I really, I do appreciate that. I appreciate it so much and uh, I appreciate all of you. So thank you for being with me this week. I hope your days are filled with all the things you love. Good growing. I'll see you next time. Bye.